All right, hello there. We are going to be talking about the some revolutions in England. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about the agricultural revolution, largely about the industrial revolution, and then about the uh, features of capitalism. So based on your reading last night, and the first thing I want you to do is to make a prediction. I want you to predict why was the agricultural revolution necessary, a necessary precursor to having the industrial revolution. Uh, so go ahead, take a moment, pause this, and with your partner, turn and have that conversation. Okay, uh, so now we're going to talk about industrialization's roots in the agricultural revolution. That agricultural, it's roots, it's... Okay, um, so uh, I just kind of want to highlight a couple things from your reading last night and kind of point a couple other things out. So this really starts with our English landowners. They're the gentry, we call them, the word comes from gentlemen. Um, maybe you remember Sister Wendy referring to them as the squirearchy. Sorry to bring up a sore subject. Um, so since 1688, the Glorious Revolution, all the way up to when we're talking about now, 1830s, they controlled Parliament, and they passed laws that benefited themselves. I know that's super surprising that a bunch of old, rich dudes um, would control government and pass laws just to benefit themselves. It's so foreign to us. Um, but anyway, um, those English landowners also began to experiment. They began to experiment with new ways of making more money from their land. Um, things like the seed drill done by Jethro Tull. <laughs> Jethro Tull, Aqualung, no? Anyway, um, the seed drill allowed for more uniform planting, uh, planting in rows, uniform depth. Um, they were practicing different fertilizers. Uh, they did the Norfolk crop rotation that was in your reading. Um, they were practicing more selective breeding. So all these different techniques they were doing to try to get more money from the land. Um, and where is all of this going on? Correct, England, that's what it says up there. Because why? What's happening on the continent that's precluding from this happening? Hopefully you said the French Revolution. Uh, so real quick with your partner, uh, you don't ever need to know the details of the Norfolk crop rotation, but um, I want you to talk with your partner. What's the outcome of this? What is the What is coming out of this system here? Okay, next we need to talk about the Enclosure Acts, and these are the big uh, laws that the Parliament was passing to uh, that benefited wealthy landowners. So Enclosure Acts have been going on for years, but it's during this era, during the early 19th century, that that really accelerates, late 18th and early 19th century. Um, essentially what happened is the commons, the common field, were seen as unprofitable. And they were seen as unprofitable because they were. That was a place where the poor could eke out an existence and could um, just kind of get by a little bit. Um, it was a common land where you could pasture your, your sheep if you had any goats, that kind of thing. Um, you could collect firewood. Uh, it was a chance. It was some shared land. Um, and so Parliament passes laws that allow the commons to be bought and sold. And so what we're going to see happen is that as these commons areas, the green areas on here, as those are bought and sold by the larger landowners, the smaller farms become untenable, become, you, you can't eke out a living on just that much land unless you have the commons. And so um, those people are going to be forced off their land. Um, and so this is going to allow large landowners to make big profits. Um, it also allows for experimentation and mechanization. So what do I mean by that? So if you are the farmer with just this little patch, here we'll go this one, this little patch of land, um, and somebody comes to you, and so this is your subsistence farmer. This is how you survive. You need this and the commons combined, and you can barely make enough food to get your family by. And somebody comes by and says, I've got this new fertilizer that you should try. It'll double your crop yield. Um, are you going to try that? Like our instinct is to say, yeah, try it, double it. But what if it doesn't work? What if it burns out your crops? Like it's not just that you don't make money. It's that your babies die. Like you starve to death. 
And so they can't afford experimentation. By the same token, how many of you have a garden? Okay, at your house, a garden. A few of you? Okay. Uh, how many of you have a tractor? No? Don't have a tractor. How come? Because it's too small. Your garden's not big enough to justify a tractor for a tractor to make sense. But if you're a larger landowner, you can just kind of use a small portion of your land and try that new fertilizer out. And if it burns out, if it doesn't work, then you just lose a few bucks. It's not your livelihood. It's not your existence that's coming into play. Um, but if it works, then you do it over the whole area next year. Uh, same thing with mechanization. Their land is big enough to justify looking for new labor-saving ways because they have so much area. And what this is going to do, and this is the results down there, is the land is going to be concentrated in the hands of a few. Small landowners are pushed out. Um, and this is just a great diagram that shows that. These large landowners are able to buy up the commons. They're able to push out the small landowners. Um, and we get just a few large landowners as opposed to the dozen or so that you see here. Um, and they're also going to be producing more. They're going to be producing more food with fewer workers because of the fertilizers, because of the mechanization, because of the Norfolk crop rotation. Um, and so this is going to free up workers for other pursuits. Um, and many of them are going to go to the cities um, because they're forced off their land. Uh, so I have as the arrow there, freed up workers for other pursuits. They go to the city. All right. So industrialization's roots. Why England? This is one of the big questions in modern history. This is one of the big questions the College Board asks. Why England? Why on earth this tiny, rocky, pissant little island in the middle of the North Atlantic? Why were they the first to industrialize? Um, there's a couple reasons why that we're going to go into here. Um, one is England had the market. England, excuse me, had the markets and had control of the sea. So that's another way of saying more boats. Um, and so they could sell more if more could be produced. If we're looking at this in economic terms, we call this the profit motive. They had incentive to produce more because they had the ability to move more, to move more product. They also had what we call the factors of production. Um, factors of production, three things. They are land, labor, and capital. Write those down. Factors of production. This is a key economic term that you need to know. Factors of production, land, labor, capital. And our definition of capital is money that you can invest. That's what capital is. Right? The money I need to spend on groceries is not capital. The money I need to pay my mortgage or to pay my heating bill or whatever, that's not capital because that's what I need to just get by. Any money that I have left over, which I don't, but theoretically if I did, that is capital. Um, and England had this in spades. They had land. Well, where did England get this land from? Well, they're, they have colonies already, and they're freeing up all of this land from the enclosure acts. Um, they have labor because all of these farmers were just kicked off of the land. Um, and they have surplus capital because of their strong economy. So that factors of production, that's a big one there. Um, another factor that England had, and I know this will come as a surprise to nobody, um, was their geography. Um, England had um, a lot of coal. England had a lot of good dirt. Um, and so, um, actually, or rather England had a lot of good stuff under its dirt. Um, England had an enormous amount of coal under its dirt, an, an, an odd amount of coal in its ground. Um, this is uh, to scale. This is what England would look like superimposed on China. Um, and this circle, England had more coal under its ground than China did in this entire circle here. Um, and if you look at the coal deposits all over the world, um, there's a couple other places that have very strong deposits, um, but England just has an odd amount of them. 
Um, we also have rivers. Um, England is crisscrossed with rivers. Um, there's no point where you are further to the sea than 70 miles, um, the nearest point on the coast, and 45 miles is the nearest tidal water. That's a river closely connected to the sea. So no matter where you go, you are easily by navigable water. Um, and that is a huge um, geographic advantage that England has. Um, so some other factors that are also into play um, is England had a tradition of entrepreneurs. Um, I like using this slide. Um, entrepreneurs is uh, our small business starters, small business owners. Um, and they have that tradition because of their experience in the age of exploration, because of the openness of their economy. They had a tradition of people starting businesses. And that's another factor that is going to add into why industrialization takes root first in England. Um, they also had the financial infrastructure, um, largely, again, because of, well, the slave trade um, and because of their transatlantic experience. Um, they had established banking practices, credit, stock companies, the stock market. They had all of these institutions in place that are going to help facilitate um, the Industrial Revolution. And the last one, um, and this one's really kind of hard to quantify, it's a climate of progress. Um, they had a forward-looking view at this point. They weren't stuck in tradition. Um, maybe the best way to explain what they had is it was the opposite of what they had in Russia, in Austria, in Spain, where they're looking backwards and not trying to advance and not willing to try new things. Uh, so the conversation I want you to now with your partners, we have A, B, C, D there, the Y, England. Um, you are writing an essay. What's your first paragraph? Which do you think is the strongest argument? What are you going to use? What are you going to argue for? Why was England the first to industrialize? Take about a minute for that conversation. Okay. Um, next thing we're going to talk about is the first industry that's impacted by the Industrial Revolution. This is the textile industry. Um, so this is cloth manufacturing. And now just as a reminder, the old way that this happened, and we talked about this during the Middle Ages, so way back to August, um, basically you would take raw cotton or wool to the spinner, which was frequently a woman, and she would spin that into thread. The thread would then go to the weaver, who was very frequently more often than not a man, and the man would weave that into cloth. Um, and I think remembering that this is closely connected to the domestic system um, is, a, uh, is a good way uh, to think about it as well. Um, now, the inventions of the Industrial Revolution are going to start to change the way we do things. Um, one of the first inventions was in 1733. This is the flying shuttle. So this doubled the work of the weaver. It doubled the output of the weaver, 1733. Now, let's think about that for a second. It doubled the work of the weaver. Who were most weavers? Right, they were men. And if you have a machine now that can do the work of two men, what's going to happen to the weaving employment opportunities? Yeah, they're going to be cut in half. And so uh, we have a situation where we have um, technology replacing jobs. Um, and this is going to freak some people out, especially because it was the men's job, especially because it was the guys who were supposed to be the breadwinners who were doing this. Um, the next significant event, it doesn't happen for 30 years. Uh, so again, this reminds me a little of our scientific revolution discussion. How revolutionary was it? How fast does it have to be for you? Um, but 30 years later, uh, the spinning Gen A uh, was invented, and this doubled the output output of the spinner. So this allowed the spinner to now keep up with the weaver. Um, and then again, another 20 years later, another almost a half a generation later, uh, the spinning mule or power frame or power loom um, was created. And essentially what this did was combine the spinner and the weaver, and the whole thing could be powered by water. Um, and so this is some of the earliest inventions, the earliest um, changes of the Industrial Revolution. This textile industry is the first to feel the changes. Uh, the next to feel the changes was a new process for making steel. 
Um, steel is a combination of iron and carbon. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, no, 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 we're good. Um, steel is a combination of iron and carbon, and basically they were making crucible steel. You don't need to know. This is more detail. Um, it was made cheaper to make. This is in the 1740s um, that this process is starting. Um, and this new steel uh, is going to be the infrastructure of the Industrial Revolution. This is going to be the backbone of the Industrial Revolution. That's what I have as the arrow there. Um, the next significant invention is going to be the steam engine. Um, so essentially, this is one of those chicken and egg things. Depleted lumber led to a need for coal. Coal so abundant in England, they didn't have to dig it up. Literally, you just go to a coal pit and you just like scrape it off the top. Well, England uses all of its trees. It basically cuts down its entire forest. So now they need to use coal. And as they start using the coal, they need to start digging deeper to get the coal. And when you dig deeper, they start hitting water because there's water everywhere in England. And now they need something to get the water out of there. So 1702, a guy by the name of Newcomen develops the first steam engine. Um, and it's not very efficient. And basically, a generation later, 1767, a guy by the name of James Watt develops a much more effective steam engine, a much more, excuse me, sorry, efficient steam engine. Um, and that is going to allow, um, this is a first huge step in mechanization. Um, this is really the first time man is using power besides animal power for all practical purposes. Um, and so this is a huge step up in power generation. Um, eventually, we're going to get the development of factories. Um, now, I have an awkward definition of factories here, but I think it'll make sense. A factory is a, so write this down, it's a single building where bulky, expensive machinery is centered. A single building where bulky, expensive machinery is centered. And I put this down as the arrow here too. Work becomes a place where people go to it. That's new with the factories. Work becomes a place people go to. For all of human history up to this point, the vast majority of people worked in or around the home. You worked on the farm. You did domestic work. You did the domestic system, the putting out system at home. If you worked in the city, you probably lived above the factory. Not excuse me. Probably lived above the shop you worked in, or slept in the shop, like our um, like our printers from the Cat Massacre. Now these machines are getting so heavy. They're getting so expensive. They're getting so big and complicated that you have to have it all in one place. And now people are going to have to go to that place. So this is a really dramatic change. Um, looking at um, the factories, I just kind of want to explain how this works. So in this example, it's kind of an awkward looking picture, but pretend like the river could turn this water wheel. So the river turns this water wheel, and then that turns this shaft, which turns that wheel, which turns this center shaft here with that. And then all of these are connected to that center shaft. So all of these are turning, which turns the individual wheels, which then turn the machines. So you can see how these are all hooked up to um, crankshafts above the top. If we look at this one, you can kind of see it too. So these are kind of closer in views of it. So again, this is the factory. This is a new development. Um, our next big um, aspect of this of uh, development of the Industrial Revolution, excuse me, also involves steam engines. Um, and this is going to be transportation. Uh, so as steam engines improve, they don't need to be this big anymore. Um, if any of you have seen the steam engines at uh, the Science at Museum of Science and Industry, you have an idea of these. Um, but as it improves, it's going to get smaller, it's going to get mobile, and it is going to go the correct way on the slideshow. Um, and it is going to uh, power transportation. Uh, steamboats by the late 1700s, 17, uh, 17, uh, 1770s, 1780s, 
um, is the big age of steamboats. And so um, they kind of reached their height in the 1860s. Um, so steamboats by the late 1700s, and then they reached their height in the 1860s. Um, and then I just love this quote from Napoleon. Um, never much of the naval person, but somebody asked him about steamships. He said, what, sure. What, sir, would you make a ship sail against the wind and currents by lighting a bonfire under her deck? I pray you excuse me. I have not the time to listen to such nonsense. Um, so he, went, he didn't always get it right, right? Um, so uh, we have these steamboats. Um, but it turns out, I know this is going to be odd, but boats only work on water. I know, I know. Try, try to stay with me. I know I'm talking a little over your head here, kids. Okay. And so if the water, if the rivers didn't go where you wanted them to, they built rivers, especially in England. Um, and they built canals. Uh, canals are man-made rivers. And so this connected other bodies of water or it connected two regions that were important. Uh, the golden age of canals uh, well, and yes, there is such a thing as the golden age of canals, trust me, um, was the 1770s to the 1830s. Uh, that was when they were the most important. So the 1770s to the 1830s. Um, and I'm just so intrigued by canals. It's such a such an interesting uh, device. Um, an interesting feature of engineering, marvel of engineering, really. Um, so you have two different levels of water that you're potentially connecting. Oh, so these are the broad canals, narrow canals is, is the purple, and then the navigable rivers. So you can see the blue are the rivers, and then the red and purple are canals that are connecting things everywhere. Um, and so if you have two different levels of water that the canals do, you basically open one gate, flood it, get the ship into the, the locks, it's called, um, flood it so that it rises up to the upper level, and then you can just continue on. Um, and uh, this is a picture of uh, an English canal in the 18th century. Um, you see it's pretty low boat so that you can go under bridges all over the place. Um, and then there's still canals. You can go on canal tours um, in Belgium and in England. Um, and, you know, here's one where the difference in the height between the two bodies of water um, was such that they couldn't do it in one lock, couldn't do it in two, and three, and four. It took five series of locks to get down there. Um, but you also get a little idea here for just how, oh, sorry, uh, just how narrow these canals are. You know, these aren't huge rivers. This isn't like seeing the Mississippi here. Like some of them are pretty narrow. Um, but both steamboats and canals are going to be eclipsed um, by the next developed transportation development, which I just kind of ruined for you by showing you there. Um, and that is, of course, the development of the choo-choo. Um, the earliest choo-choo was in 1829, um, and that's going to connect a coal town to a manufacturing town. Connects a coal town. That's what I have as the arrow. To a manufacturing town. So the coal was in one place. So the factory was in the other place, and now the choo-choo is going to be able to put them together. It's actually Liverpool to Manchester, if you're curious. So it actually connects a beetle town to a soccer town, I guess, too. But um, And then by the 1840s, oh, here's my girl standing next to the rocket, which is a, a model of one of the first trains ever. Shannon was not having it that particular day. Um, by the 1840s, um, the U.S. and England are greatly building up the uh their railroad and the, the u.s and england especially it's going to explode in um and so what i want you to do right now is with this data because i've been talking for long enough um with this data i want you to draw three conclusions from this data now the first thing you need to understand is how this chart works all entries are based on an index value of 100 equal to the per capita level of great britain in 1900 so this is per capita levels of industrialization, not just railroad. Oh, that's a big part of the measurement. And 1900 Britain is the base of 100%. And what does per capita mean? Make sure we know that, too. So go ahead and with your partner, take a minute and talk about three different conclusions you can draw from this chart. There's a lot of information here. Go for it. Okay, just a wealth of information in this chart, and hopefully you were... Uh, 
you're able to mine with your partner a little bit there. Um, next, I want to take a look um, at a couple maps also and talk about some of this. Um, so if we look at uh, this slide, and you're you're going to draw some conclusions based on these on uh, these two maps. So I'm just going to kind of jump back and forth between the two of them, and then you can toggle back and forth and run the video. Is between the two maps another three conclusions? What can you draw? What three conclusions can you draw from these two maps? So go ahead and have that conversation now. Okay. And then next, I just want to take a quick look at this chart because this is railroad line in kilometers. Um, so the, the orange is 1830, the green is 1850. And I think this map, this chart is especially instructive. I mean, you see in 1830, basically everybody's at zero here, except England. They already have a total, a whopping total of 157 kilometers. Um, but then by 1850, Great Britain has almost 10,000 kilometers, um, which is roughly, not roughly, which is more than everybody else does combined. If we say this is close to six, three, um, one and a half, like just insane. And then also keep in mind how big England is. Like England is like this big actual size, right? Like compared to Russia, compared to what's going to become France, or what's going to become Germany, France. Um, and the fact that they have that much choo-choo going on. Um, is pretty amazing. Uh, so the next thing we need to talk about is the spread of industrialization, and this is a really important idea. Um, essentially, we can say industrialization started right in England, um, and then it is going to spread to the continent. It's going to spread geographically. Um, industrialization's ideas and concepts really kind of hit into Belgium by about 1800. Um, they um, uh, then follow into northern Germany, um, largely led by Prussia um, in the 1830s, so we're right here. Um, both Belgium and northern German states in, uh, imported Brits to help them. Uh, they, brought, they hired engineers, they hired uh, managers, they hired any English who would come who had any expertise whatsoever um, in running factories. Um, by 1850, uh, France is getting industrialized, um, but it's much more gradually, it's much less complete. Um, really, only Parisian France starts to see um, heavy industry. You see a couple other cities. Um, but uh, the stat I like to give here is, so 1850, we say France is more or less industrialized, um, but still 75% of the country lived on farms. 75% of the country was rural. Um, and so it's much less disruptive. Industrialization is much less disruptive uh, than it is in England. Um, and then if we look beyond our center of Western Europe here, if we look to Spain, if we look into Austria, if we look to Italy, if we look into Russia, um, it is very limited and it is very regional. Um, there's different political and cultural reasons at play here. And in some cases, they're actually choosing not to industrialize. Um, Russia actively chooses not to industrialize because they're uh, landowners, their boyers, don't see them making any money off of it. Um, so they want to keep it out. They don't want any part of it. Uh, Spain is similarly risk averse. They don't have a group of entrepreneurs. They don't have business people who really want to introduce this, who want to make this a thing. Um, the one part that I do want to point out, and the College Board emphasizes this, is that the state is much more directly involved on the continent than in England. Um, in England, you have a lot more entrepreneurs, you have joint stock companies, you have private businesses setting things up um, on the continent, almost as an effort to kind of catch up. Um, they are going to, the governments are going to uh, help facilitate that. Um, and then this is just a, another, I think, and just a cool map. Um, that shows all the different industries, coal deposits, iron ore deposits. Like, there's almost more than you can possibly look at at any one time on this map. Um, and the part that I think is really interesting is percent of population living in cities of 100,000 or more. So kind of a, a map of population density. Um, and you can really see how that coincides with some geographic 
um, anomalies about where the coal is, about where the iron is. Um, then you see the choo-choo, the railroads. Um, so this is a cool snapshot of Europe in 1850. And then some more College Board key concepts. Um, I want to talk about the Malthusian crisis for a moment here. Um, so Thomas Malthus and the idea of the Malthusian crisis. That's what a, the and is there, M-A-L-T-H-U-S-I-A-N crisis, the Malthusian crisis. Um, so he wrote an essay in 1798, so right as industrialization is kind of getting its uh, getting its legs under to it, under it called an essay on the principle of population. And he made a prediction that population growth would eventually outstrip food production. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, because population grows geometrically, it goes 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and that's as high as I can go without having to like use my fingers. But food can only go up arithmetically, can only increase arithmetically. And so he was saying at some point there's going to be a crisis. And if you look at the chart there, um, that's where he says when the resources um, cannot keep up with the population growth, that is going to be the point of crisis. Now. Industrialization, some people thought, could be the answer because it can produce more food. But that's also part of the problem because if there's more food, population is going to increase. Um, and so he eventually is proven wrong. And I have this just written next to the chart. Like Europe escaped this, and they see very steady population growth. And so he was proven very wrong. Um, but he was still incredibly influential on the era. And still, the idea of a Malthusian crisis um, is always of concern, and people still use that term. All right. So last but not least, we need to talk about capitalism. We need to talk about the rise of capitalism, some of the key features of capitalism. Um, so there's all kinds of physiocrats. There's all kinds of enlightenment thinkers. There's people we can point to. More than anybody else, the person we can point to as kind of the person who defined capitalism is Adam Smith. Um, and so he's a name to know, Adam Smith, in his book, The Wealth of Nations, um, which was written in 1776, or published, I should say, in 1776. So this is like the height of the Enlightenment, right? Like American Revolution stuff going on. It is an enlightened attack on mercilism. All right, so it's an attack on mercantilism, but it's using enlightenment ideas. So to make sure we understand where this came from, the first thing I need you to do is have a conversation about what do you remember about mercantilism? What were the economic features of mercantilism? See what you can remember. Go for it. Okay, so maybe you remember that in mercantilism, one of the key ideas was that trade, that, that uh, economics was a zero-sum game because there's only so many rocks, right? Only so many valuable rocks. That, if you gave some, that meant somebody else was losing some because it had to be zeroed out. What Adam, with, what Adam Smith says is that trade is not a zero-sum game, that there is unlimited wealth out there. That's what the arrow should be there, unlimited wealth. And he wants to reduce the barriers that hindered the economic growth of the people wanted to reduce the barriers that hindered the economic growth of the people, not the state. Because you remember, mercantilism was set up to benefit the state. And so Adam Smith is saying, here's a new way. Let's take out all these regulations. Let's take out all these things that stop people from making money. And so his concepts are no government intervention. Government should stay out of the economy. No guilds or unions, those are improper in his mind. He also talked about creating a division of labor, our idea of an assembly line. Um, he uses the pin factory example. Um, that's what this is a picture of. I just feel like I have to tell you Adam Smith pin factory because whenever you talk wealth of nations, like it's one of the things you have to say. And so I said it, he did it, so the assembly line. Like it's cheaper to have one person cut the wire, one person sharpen the head, one person stamp the head, one person solder the head, rather than have um, the same person do the whole process. 
anyway, more detail than it's necessary. These are some of the ideas that he talked about. So here is our definition of capitalism, and you need to know this definition because eventually we're going to talk about socialism also, and you need to see how these are similar and different in communism and that matter too. So our definition of capitalism is the factors of production. Well, you got to remember what the factors of production are. Take a second right now and talk with your partner, see if you remember. If you don't, flip over to the earlier page of the lecture and make sure you know what the factors of production are. I'm waiting. Okay. The factors of production are controlled by individuals for their own benefit. So the land, the labor, and the capital are controlled by individuals for their own benefit. <coughs> Excuse me. That's our definition of capitalism. So let's talk about some basic capitalist principles to understand how capitalism works. Um, capitalist principles say goods and services are exchanged for profit. Goods and services are exchanged for profit. Uh-huh. Oh, $20. I wanted a peanut. $20 can buy many peanuts. Explain it. I don't know what happened there. Um, so that's one capitalist principle. Money can be exchanged for goods and services. It can be exchanged for profits. Another feature of capitalism is that human labor is a commodity for sale. Labor itself is for sale. La this is what I have as the arrow. Labor is a source of value. So not just the goods it produces. So in a mercantilist system, the goods that are produced, that has value. The labor doesn't. Capitalism is saying labor is itself a source of value. We also need to talk about the invisible hand. I have some of these terms bolded because they're important capitalist terms. The invisible hand of the market. Um, the idea is that supply and demand will guide the free market and it will be self-regulating. Okay, so supply and demand, that's what determines the price of something. If supply is high and demand is low, what is the price? It's low. Because supply is high, there's a lot of it. Demand is low. If demand is high and supply is low, price is going to be through the roof. This is what happens every Christmas time um, when there's that one in-demand gift. Um, when I was a kid, there was Tickle Me Elmo's was one of the big things. And parents would, like, punch each other in stores over it. They were being bought and sold on eBay. Um, PlayStation something, four, five, I don't know, like same kind of thing. Um, and the free market will determine that, will determine the price of something. If I create a product and people want it, I can keep charging more and more and more until I reach a point where people won't pay for it anymore. So then I have to bring my price down a little bit. That's the free market. And it is inherently, as Adam Smith says, it is self-regulating. It will do it itself. We don't need government intervention. We don't need unions or guilds to kind of help that along. It will work itself out. Um, another feature of capitalism or basic principle is the profit motive, um, is that individuals seek self-interest. Um, and I think it's important to understand that that doesn't mean greed. We think self-interest and immediately we think like, gimme, 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 mine, 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 greed. Um, it just means it's not the king's interest or it's not the state's interest. People want to profit for themselves. Um, the mercantile system, there was opportunity to make money for individuals, but the system was set up for the state to benefit. Adam Smith is sitting here saying, and later capitalist uh, philosophers are saying, like, no, people are going to do things to make money for themselves. Um, we already kind of alluded to this or talked about this one, not alluded. Um, the lie of supply and demand, uh, and that determines the cost of an item. Uh, that is going to determine um, how much something costs, it, it, the demand versus the supply, um, all kinds of raw material issues in there. 
um, but that is going to be what determines the cost of an item. Uh, another feature of capitalism is the law of competition. Uh, the law of competition, write this down, and then we'll explain a little bit here. It makes production the most cost efficient. It makes production the most cost efficient. If we both, to use the Smith, uh, the Adam Smith example, if we both have pin factories, and I am making pin factories the old way, where one person cuts the wire, and the same person sharpens the end, and the same person stamps the head, and the same person solders the head, that takes a long time. That's not very efficient. Whereas you guys, you have your pin factory on the other side of town. I mean, people are using a lot of pins these days. I don't know what's going on. And you have one person who cuts the wire, then he passes that wire on to somebody else who sharpens the end, who passes it on to somebody else who stamps the head, passes that on to somebody else who solders, solders the head. And it's going to go much more quickly. Um, and so that law of competition is going to make things most cost efficient. You are going to make more pins for cheaper than my factory was. But now here's the thing about competition, is that inherently some will lose. Like in that situation, I'm going to lose. In competitions, people lose, unless it's soccer and there's ties, which is weird. But anyway, there's some will lose. But Adam Smith said this was a lesser evil and it was worth taking those risks. It was worth accepting that some people were going to lose because that would be better for the customer. No, who were the customers and where are they getting money and were they the people who worked at my factory? Those are different factors that we, that we are going to have to talk about at some point. Um, the next idea is this idea of laissez-faire. Um, laissez-faire is a French term which literally means leave things alone. Um, it often is a, uh, it translated as hands off. Um, and the idea of laissez-faire is that the government should stay out of the economy. The government should have nothing to do with the economy. Let the invisible hand, let supply and demand, let these things self-regulate, and it will be best for the people. And what's best for the people is best for the state. And then so the last term we need to know is this idea of economic liberalism. That's everything we just described, okay? Um, economic liberalism is the original unregulated capitalism. That is economic liberalism, the original unregulated capitalism. And that's what we've been describing here in our basic capitalist principles. And so we've gone through some technological, we started with agricultural developments, went through some technological developments, and then we went through some economic developments here. And this is the Industrial Revolution. This is basically the crux of what is happening, first in England and then transferring to the continent. Um, and this is ultimately going to set up a, a showdown for us here of our man Adam Smith um, versus one of the best sets of facial hair that we'll see. Um, and we'll meet Karl Marx uh, just after break. Um, so uh, thank you for following along with this. You guys are rock stars. Um, and we'll touch base uh, next time. Later.